This is a series that we've been on for some time, going over the seven letters written to the seven churches in Asia Minor. The idea and the concept of this, uh, if you will, a, a question we ask is, if Jesus were to evaluate our church, what do you think he would say? And would Jesus even do that? And the answer is absolutely yes, for he has already done that. In the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3, he provided seven evaluation letters to seven specific local congregations in the first century Asia Minor. We went over uh, the first six, or, and we are going to conclude with our last letter. But the first letter was the church of Ephesus. Everybody say Ephesus. Ephesus is a great church doing a great work for the Lord. They are morally upright. They're doctrinally sound. They are a persevering church. But Jesus makes this accusation against them that they have lost their first love. And he gives them opportunity to remember the heights from which they've fallen to repent. And you know, repentance is a good thing because it's Jesus allowing you to come back into the fullness of life. It's an invitation. You can choose to accept it or decline it, but it's there for you. And then he says to return. Return to what? Return to the works that came out of that first love. Not the feelings, but the works that came out of it. So if you're here and you feel like you have lost your first love, here's what Jesus says. Remember the heights which you, have, which you had fallen. You repent and you return back to those works that came out of that first love. Then we move to Smyrna. Smyrna was a faithful church. They were facing some of the most uh, intense persecution any Christians throughout all of history has ever experienced. They were verbally and physically assaulted. They were dragged throughout the streets. Their homes were plundered. They were put in prison and they were stoned. Many of them were killed. But Jesus tells them to hold on, to hang in there. Be faithful unto death so that way you may receive the crown of life. And what we've discovered is like the church in Smyrna, we all are going to experience some heartbreaks and some pain. And we know this, that life is not always easy, but God's grace is always enough. Can I get an amen? Then we move to Pergamum. Pergamum was a church that was being deceived. And it's not that they didn't love the word of God. They were just so open-minded that they were receiving different doctrines of teaching. And these were doctrines of error. And many of them uh, were uh, doctrines that were dangerous. So Jesus warns them, beware of dangerous doctrines. In other words, be careful who you listen to. We move to Thyatira. Thyatira was strong in its love, but it was experiencing a significant element of doctrinal corruption. They were afraid to confront sin. There's a self-proclaimed prophetess referred to as Jezebel, who was leading God's people away from truth and was promoting a doctrine of error, compromise, and immorality. But Jesus is so gracious and kind. He gave her space to repent, but she refused it. And Jesus warns the believers there, stop tolerating Jezebel. In other words, stop tolerating things that are pulling you away from God and from truth. Then we move to Sardis. It's a church that's full of so much life and vitality, or so one would assume. How many of you know that looks can be deceiving? This looked like a church that was alive, but when the great physician Jesus Christ puts his finger on the pulse of this church, he declares that this church is dead. Then he tells them to wake up, strengthen the things for which that remain, and he says, for your works are not done yet. That's the word for the church. It's if you feel lethargic, you feel like you're barely alive, Jesus is telling you to wake up because you're not done yet. The moment that you're done is the moment you stop breathing, but as long as you're still, still breathing, you are not yet done. Then last week, Philadelphia, everybody say Philly. Philadelphia, a healthy and faithful church, rich in good works. They, lo they were loyal to God's word and they were unashamed of their faith. And Jesus tells them, I've set before you an open door. I know where they're saying the door is open, opening up a door of ministry and opportunity and growth and development. He said, I've set before you an open door, and if the door is open, walk through it. If you're afraid to walk through it, don't be afraid, because the same grace that, that, that he gave, has given to you to open it, he'll give you the same grace that will sustain you when you walk through it. So op walk through these open doors. And here is our last stop. It's Laodicea. Laodicea. This is the final letter that we are going to be reading today. And I'm going to go ahead and read uh, from chapter 3, verse 14. And he, whoever has an ear to hear, let him hear what God's saying, the Spirit of God saying to the church. So let's read together. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, these are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither 
cold nor hot, and I wish you were either one or the other. So become, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the finer so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Title of today's and final message of our series, Dear Church, is Dear Laodicea, Temperature Matters. I had two other subtitles. Can I give it to you? You can choose which one you want. It's Dear Laodicea, Knock Knock. No? Dear Laodicea, I just didn't know how to spell that out. Choose which one you want. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, we thank you for this uh, privilege that we have to open up your word and for the Spirit of God to enlighten us and reveal to us what you would say to your church. Our ears are ready to hear what you would have to say and our hearts are ready to receive that word. We ask, Lord God, that uh, any person who is here that could relate to this message, you're already speaking to their hearts right now. I pray that it's softening it. And uh, Lord, you're challenging us. And and our our desire, Lord God, is that our temperature begins to increase, that there would be a a fervency and a, a, a rekindling of sorts of a fire that's in us, whether it be a flick, uh, just barely flickering, or if it's been put out, we ask for a new fire. For fires that are remaining, Lord, we ask that you would increase and add fuel to that fire. We give you the glory and the praise for what you're going to do. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Go ahead and put your hands together. Let's give God praise in this place. Amen. Thank you very much, Miles. So located in, in the middle of the Lycus Valley is one of the most wealthiest cities ever to exist. It's the city of Laodicea. In comparison to other wealthy cities, uh, Laodicea, just to kind of give you some some comparison of of how wealthy they were, other wealthy cities would have at least one theater, but for Laodicea, they had two, Santikos and Ebo, two theaters. Other wealthy cities had stadiums that could accommodate 20 to 30,000 people, but in Laodicea, they had a stadium that could accommodate 65,000 people. In other cities, they would have at least two major marketplaces, shopping centers, but in Laodicea, they had four shopping centers uh, with about 44 or 4,500 shopping um, uh, uh, or 4,500 different stores in the four shopping centers. How many are you excited about that? Like, it's been real, San Marcos, but you've been replaced. 4,500 different shopping stores, four different shopping centers. How many here have a shopping problem? Anybody here like to shop? Okay, anybody have a shopping problem? You don't want to admit, some people are like, I don't have a shopping problem. People have a problem with my shopping. <laughs> Sometimes this is a meme I read. It says, it says, you went to buy groceries, then you f- saw a fabulous must-have handbag, and then you come back with new shoes. That's like a, a problem with shop. My wife's supposed to go to HEB. She comes back with a bag full of stuff from Ross. And I'm like, I thought you go to HEB. She comes back and she pulls out a dress and she says, you know what, you would never get, you would never believe this dress used to cost $100 and I got it on sale for $10. So I bought 10 of them for the price of one. (laughs) She's like, I can't help it. I'm a helper. I'm trying to help the economy. Yeah. But they knew how to shop. Very wealthy, influential area. And Laodicea was iconic and influential in in three primary industries. The first industry is finance. Everybody say finance. Finance, similar to Wall Street, this was the major banking center in all of Asia Minor. And because of that, it attracted people of means. Uh, It was 
well known throughout the Roman Empire of their wealth and their financial power. And they had so much resources that in 61 AD, when they suffered a massive earthquake that decimated the entire city, the Roman government usually would step in to help fund the rebuild, but they refused it. They had so much resources and wealth within the city that they rebuilt themselves. They didn't need a stimulus check. It was also famous not just for finance, but also for fashion. Laodicea was the fashion capital in its day. If you wanted to find the newest styles or the fashion trends, you'll find it at Laodicea. It was also known for its thriving textile industry. What they did is they produced and exported uh, luxury garments and clothing that was produced from uh, a black soft wool that could only be found in Laodicea. So for those of you who like to wear black, you can only find it at Laodicea. If you want to look slimming, you got to go there. It's also known for pharmaceutical or medicine. In, in fact, some of their coins were minted with some of the famous physicians uh, in the city. There was a very famous medical school there in Laodicea which produced a powder that when it's mixed with water, produced this clay that if you put that clay on your eyes, it was believed to heal certain eye ailments. So it's not only just known for those three things, it was also known for a church there. In this church at Laodicea was no doubt affected by the city because they were very much like the city that they resided in. They were what seemed to be very, uh, had in possession very, an, a very inexhaustible supply of wealth and resources. They had an independent spirit. They had an attitude that's, that was pervasive and entrenched. It's a, an attitude of self-reliance, self-confidence, self-serving, self-seeking, and self-sufficient. And whenever believers get to the point that they uh, believe that they're sufficient in themselves, they'll begin to glow with something that we call pride. And they became distracted by their wealth and this luxury, luxurious living. And in their inexhaustible wealth and their independent spirit, the congregation in Laodicea receives a rebuke from the Lord. Everybody say rebuke. I like saying that. I just don't like receiving a rebuke. This letter that was written to this church contains some of the sharpest words of all the letters written to the churches in Asia Minor. In terms of its piercing quality and penetrating intent, its purpose is to awaken a prideful, indifferent, and lethargic church. And this is the only letter in all of the letters that contains no, uh, no positive review, commendation, or praise. Not one word whatsoever. And so Jesus opens up and he says in verse 14, 15, excuse me, he says, I know your deeds. The Greek word I know is no is oida, means he personally knows. First-hand knowledge. I've seen what you've done. And here's Jesus' assessment. He says, that you, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit, another translation uses the word vomit, you out of my mouth. Jesus uses two words, hot and cold. Everybody say hot, say cold. This side hot, this side cold. Hot, cold. I feel like it's like a Sesame Street, like, near, far. You ever seen that one with Grover? It's like back and forth. Hot, cold. He's saying they're hot and cold. Now, why does Jesus use these, this terminology, you're hot, cold, you're not hot, you're not cold, you're lukewarm. Now, a little bit of geography and history is going to help us understand this analogy and uh, really uh, allow us to see the picture or the richness of this imagery. So I'm going to give you an, some history and also a little bit of geography. So in the middle of this, this area, Nestled between two other wealthy cities is Laodicea on a plat uh, high plateau, on a hilltop. Now, to the east of it, 10 miles uh, to the east of the city, is a city called Colossae. You guys familiar with Colossae? If you're, you're not, you probably are. You just don't realize that Colossae is one of the 
uh, epistles that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Colossae. We call it Col- Col- Colossians, right? So it's that, this, this city. Now to the north, six miles to the north of the city of Laodicea is another wealthy city, and that city is called Hierapolis. Everybody say Hierapolis. So you got in the middle, you got Laodicea. To the east of it, you have Colossae. To the north of it, you have Hierapolis. Now, what's the significance of both cities? Well, both of them are like luxury, vacation-type, you know, uh, cities. Just people would just travel there. What uh, the church in Colossae was really known for, excuse me, the city of Colossae was known for was its cold water springs. Uh, what would happen is that in the, the, the mountaintops, that when the ice would begin to thaw out, it would flow down to the city. And so on a hot summer day, getting a nice cold slushy from this mountain or the water supply, it's almost like going to Sonic. It's like slushies all the time. Very cold water, and it was refreshing. Now, in Hierapolis, they were known for their hot mineral springs. And what was believed is that when you would bathe in these hot mineral springs, that it had some kind of healing agent, that if you jumped in, you need had some ailments, you would be healed of it. It was such a, 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 a very well-traveled-to area where people would vacation there. They said that Cleopatra and Mark Antony tra- traveled there on their honeymoon and swam in these and bathed in these hot spring waters. So here, here's, you got cold water here, you got hot water over here, and then you have Laodicea who has no water supply. So what they had to do was pipe in the water from the neighboring cities. So if they wanted cold water, they had to pipe it in to Colossae, and they had to receive it from them. They wanted the hot water. They had a, 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 a stone aqueduct pipe that would go through this city of Hierapolis to Laodicea. So just imagine our faucets. You want cold? Turn that on. You want hot? This on, right? But what happened was by the time the cold water reached the city of Laodicea, it became tepid and lukewarm. By the time the hot water six miles away, would come into the city, it would be tepid and lukewarm. And in some cases, very chalky because of the stone aqueducts. What was happening is at the moment someone would turn on thinking that they're going to get some cold water, they would drink the water and spit it out because it's lukewarm and chalky. Same with the hot water. And what Jesus is saying is, your faith and your works are just like that. You think it's cold, but it's not. It's lukewarm. If you think it's refreshing, which your, your faith and you think your works are refreshing. It's not. It's tepid and lukewarm. You think that you're the, the hot and the invigor- invigorating hot springs of the water that comes from Hierapolis with a healing uh, element to it. You think that's your faith and you think that's your works, but it's not. It's tepid. It's lukewarm. It's, 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 it's stale. Now, <clears throat> everybody say lukewarm. Lukewarm. Now, I don't drink coffee, um, so let me just kind of give you a little disclaimer there. I, I think, is any, let me ask this question. There's not many people like me, but does anybody here not like coffee? You do not like coffee. Okay, just a few of us. All right. How many of you here like hot coffee? Raise your hand. It's got to be piping hot. How many here like iced coffee? It's got to be cold. Like, okay. How many of you here like room temperature coffee? Can I see your hand? Thank you very much. Second, first service, two people raise their hand. I'm like, no, put your hand down. You're messing up my illustration. <laughs> I'm going to admit, I don't drink coffee. I tried it when I graduated college. My, I got hired at the firm, and everybody there was had a pot of, uh, not a pot, they had a cup of coffee in their hand, and I felt like to look more professional, I also, too, needed to start drinking coffee. And I took a sip of coffee, and I spit it right back out just because I just don't like the taste. Uh, coffee is not my go-to drink. Chocolate milk is. Nesquik specifically. And so what I started doing is I started, instead of putting coffee in a coffee mug, I would put Nesquik hot cho- uh, or chocolate or, cold, or you know, cool chocolate milk in it, and I just walk around, make myself look like I am professional. <laughs> so I don't drink coffee, but what I have heard is that most people do not like room temperature coffee. Most people don't like coffee that's been sit, sit uh, sitting in the counter all day, and you just pick it up and start drinking it. You usually have to do something. Either you're going to make a new pot, or you're going to warm it up inside the microwave because you want it either hot or you're going to have it cold, but you definitely do not want it lukewarm. And Jesus says that you are neither hot nor cold. 
you are lukewarm, and because you are lukewarm, I'm going to, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Now, Jesus doesn't mince his words when he's rebuking. When he's assessing your spiritual condition, he's going to get right to it. If someone said that to you, you know what, what you're doing right now? You, you make me want to throw up. Like, some people get real upset about that, right? You're like, how rude. But Jesus is saying this because he loves this church. And he's saying, this church, you make me sick, sick to my stomach. It's nauseating when I look at your faith and your works. It makes me want to gag or it makes me want to vomit. If he didn't love them, he would have ended it right there and dropped the mic. You make me want to, and he would have stopped. But he continued. He's giving them a remedy because he, he loves them. What has happened to this church? Church became lukewarm. Lukewarm means uh, a church, uh, lukewarm just means indifferent, having lost temperature, and thereby have lost its value. When your coffee gets lukewarm, it loses not only its temperature, it also loses its value. Nobody's going to pay for five bucks for room temperature coffee. And this church is no longer healing, no longer refreshing. It's no longer cold. It's no longer hot. Once they once were, they no longer are. And they've lost something very valuable over the process of time. And this church has become indifferent. They become apathetic. They become comfortable in themselves, in what they have. You know, you remember back in the day, I know some, most of you here uh, are doing it, a finan- you're in a financial position where you feel like you're doing all right. But do you guys remember back in those days, like when you just needed $5 to buy something at McDonald's and you didn't sure in your debit card you had enough and you swiped the debit card and you're praying in tongues? You remember that? You're really seeking the Lord. Like, please, Lord, let uh, someone take it from somebody else's account and drop and deposit in mine. The wealth of the wicked is going to be stored up for the righteous in Jesus' name. Find somebody wicked and deposit that $5 so I don't get an overdraft fee or get canceled and be embarrassed, right? We pray and pray. You know, when we have money, it means we have options. And so for third world countries, they couldn't afford health care. What do they do? They got to pray. They seek God. But for us, we got other options. You know, if you got money, just, just pay your, your copay and pay whatever bills you need to pay and, and you'll, be, you'll be taken care of. But, but here, this church has become indifferent. They become apathetic. They're not burning with passion for Jesus, but they're Not burning with passion, but they're also not completely cold either. They're lukewarm. They're in between. They're complacent. And the Lord detested it. But they weren't always like this. If you read in Colossians chapter 4, verse 12, you may have not seen it before, but Laodicea is mentioned there. Paul says to the church in Colossae, he tells them, read this letter and then also read it. Allow the Christians in Laodicea to read it as well. And he says, and also read the letter that I wrote them. So Paul wrote a letter also to the church in Laodicea. And in that same letter, in Colossians chapter 1, it talks about their, their devotion to the Lord and their love for their brothers and sisters in Christ. They were once devoted. They were once passionate, but they have now lost its, their zeal, their passion for the, for the things of God. And when I think about passion and, and, and fire I think about fuel at times. And if things about a fire is that a fire will eventually go out if you do nothing about it. You just let it keep going, eventually it's going to go out. Question I have is that there are some people whose fires are flickering, but you think that fuel is being added to your fire, but it's it's not fuel, it's it's water. Or it's it's Kool-Aid. It's sweet and sugary, and it sounds good, but it's putting out your fire. So the question is, you ask is like, what is being poured on me? Or what am I allowing myself to take in? That's why I'm very careful about what I listen to. When I stream or if I watch other things, I'm very careful because I don't want to allow something that I think is truth or I think it's fuel that's going to fan the flame of God, uh, the fire of God in my heart, not realizing that it's starting to dissipate or my fire is starting to be, be put out. So you got to be careful What's being put on you? Knowing what's being put on you and what's being put in you. And this is what they said. This is how they became lukewarm. He says this. He says, you say I'm rich and I've acquired wealth and you do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you're wretched, you're pitiful, you're poor, you're blind, 
and you're naked. Now, he says they became lukewarm because of this attitude. I'm rich, and I've acquired great wealth, and I don't, don't need anything. Now, what he's not saying is they became lukewarm because they're rich. They became lukewarm warm because they're prideful. They no longer are looking to the Lord. They're looking to themselves. They're the center of their own world. And God wants people to have things, but in our having, he doesn't want what we have to have us. And there are some people who have shifted their focus away from the Lord, and now they've shifted it onto their status of being rich, of their possessions, what they've accumulated, this great wealth, or even of prosperity. Now, what the Bible is never, does ever suggest is that there is a premium on poverty. Like, if you look throughout the Bible, anytime you see poverty, it's always a curse. And how many of you have been in poverty and can testify that poverty is a curse? To have lack. God's desire is for you to be prosperous. Now, prosperity doesn't mean that every single person is going to drive a Mercedes Benz, although that would be nice. But prosperity means that you have more than enough of what you need to fulfill what God's called for you to do in your life. And for some people, they're going to require more. Others are not. But you're going to always have more than enough than what you need to fulfill what God has called for you to do. And when we talk about riches, I think in America we can maybe relate and understand that it can, we can easily take our eyes off of God and put it on our stuff. Would you guys agree with that? It would be very, very easy to do that. The reason why Jesus spoke so much about money and possessions more so than anything else. In fact, it was like one out of every seven scriptures is about possessions and money. Jesus, over half his parables he spoke about was about money and riches. The reason why is because money is the chief competitor to your heavenly father. Money offers the same thing God does, although it can never fulfill on its promise. It promises acceptance. Money promises identity. Money promises security, and money promises purpose, but it cannot deliver on its promise. It'll eventually fail you. Some people are like, well, I don't really care about money. Is that anybody here? You say you don't care about money? Yeah, it's a few of us, right? Let's just be, you know, just take, let's, I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to honest, honestly answer it in your heart, okay? Tell me what makes you more excited. Like, what if this were real? Guess what? You guys won the lottery. Every person here won the lottery. You won the lottery. The Mega Millions. Is that what it's called, the Mega Millions? What's the big one? Anybody know what that one's called? Powerball. Oh, you play? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, just, I was just waiting for somebody to answer so I could say that. All right, now just, just, say, just say you won the Powerball. How many would be really legitimately excited, right? It would be excited. Okay, does that excite you more than this? Did you know that 2,000 years ago, Jesus made a way for your salvation? He forgave you of your sins, and he gave you the gift of eternal life. If you believe in him, you'll never perish in eternity. and all eternity, you're going to be with him in heaven. What excites you more? Honestly. Not like Jesus, of course. Jesus, right? You're like, this one, of course, but do I still get the money? <laughs> He's like, you kind of want, <laughs> you want maybe both uh, a little bit. But it, if we asked ourselves, Jesus says, you cannot serve both God and money. He's never said that about anything else. You can't serve two masters. You're either going to love one or despise the other, or you despise one and you'll love the other. So this is another question I ask. Some of you already know this, this one. Which one's going to cause the most anxiety in your life? Two statements I'm going to give you. Tell me which statement causes the most anxiety. Number one, there is no God. Or no, number two, you're out of money. Like, Really, be honest, what causes more anxiety for you? There's no God or there is no money. Now, let me take it a little further. Imagine you're in the hospital and you only have a week left to live. <clears throat> Which statement now causes most anxiety? Just a week left. Money? Well, there's no God. No money, no God. Now, if your faith is going to be in God at the end of your life, you might as well have faith in him in the middle of your life. And don't put your trust in provision, but put your trust in the provider. Don't put your trust in riches. Put your trust in the one who so richly provides. Amen? You following me? 
just talk a little bit about money here. Have you ever had this thought? Either I need money or God needs to show up. And sometimes we think money's the answer. I'm, I'm going to give you two, two instances. You see in, in John chapter, uh, uh, what is it, 4 or 5? What is it, the feeding of the 5,000? Is that John 8, 7? It's somewhere in the Bible. Feeding of 5,000. Do you, do you remember when Jesus said to them, you feed them? The 5,000 men plus women and children, his disciples. And what is their response? The response is money. They're like, it's going to cost a fortune. It's going to 200 denarii. One denarii is one day's wage. That means that's eight months' salary is going to cost, require for us to pay it. They're thinking that's the answer is money. But Jesus says, no, it's not money. What do you have? He says, give me what you have and give it to me. Give your own provision and source and give it to the resource, the source, that being Jesus. It's not money is the answer. Jesus is the answer. That's what he's getting at. In Acts chapter 3, there's a beggar who's begging for money, and he sees uh, Peter and John, and, and he's asking for money because he thinks money's the answer. But they said, silver and gold we do not have. That's not the answer that you need. But what I do, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Get up and walk. What are they saying? Money's not the answer. Jesus is the answer. So every decision that you make, if money is not your God, then it cannot be the reason why you do things, the primary reason why you do things. If it's the primary reason why you do things, then you have to ask yourself, am I being led by money or am I being led by God? And you know it's God, it's his peace that will rule your heart and it'll be the determining factor of every single thing that you do. So when you as parents begin to talk with your children about their future, don't just talk about money unless that's your God. Talk about God. What is God calling you to do? What, what mark are you going to make on this earth? What, what, what has God put in your heart to do? Not saying you can't consider money, but don't make it the fi- uh, primary focus. You know how I know people, especially in America and even in the Christian church in the Western world, they, they worship money, is that they could be growing and thriving in a community, but the moment they get offered a $10,000 increase to move to a different, different city, they don't even pray about it. They'll uproot their family for the money. It's not about the money. It's about your attitude towards it. Who do you worship? Who do you look to? Are you self-sufficient, self-reliant? Or you say, you know, Lord, I realize everything I have came from you. You alone are my source. And if I have need, absolutely I have need. You know, they didn't think they had need. They said, we have everything. We have no need. But you know, even if your needs are met, this is what I say, Lord, I still need you. I am not moving forward unless you're coming with me. Not leading this church unless you're with me. I'm not moving, Lord, unless you're with me. If you're not in it, I'm not going. Amen. I was about to say something. I hope hope this doesn't offend anybody. Well, it doesn't want to offend anybody. Jed Bush, I remember he was doing some kind of, he's getting fired up, trying to get his his group to be fired up, and nobody was clapping. He goes, please clap. I don't know if you all remember that, but I almost said that. Please clap right there. Like, Pastor Joe, I'm waiting for that clap. <laughs> so here's what they said. You say you're rich and you've acquired wealth and do not need a thing. He says, but you don't realize that you're wretched, pitiful, you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. That's your real condition. You think that you're rich, you acquired everything, you don't need of anything, you have need of anything at all. He says, but you don't realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and you're naked. You think you're rich, you're not. You think you're, you have vision, you're not. You're blind. You think you're clothed, you're not. You're naked. You think you're great, no, you're not. You're wretched and you're pitiful. That's your true spiritual condition. I'm not saying prophetically to anybody. That's why I'm speaking about the church in Laodicea. You, you know, it's that thought. Have you ever had that happen to you before where you thought you had something, only realize you don't have it? This is uh, speaking of, uh, for, this is for Pastor John Lottery. Um, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You said the Powerball, so. In China, this is a true story. This Chinese man, young man, about 28 years old, uh, played the lottery, and uh, he put the ticket away, and then he, the next morning he looked at the, the, the winning numbers, and he saw the winning numbers, and he's like, I think this is, this is the, the, I have the ticket. I, I got all these numbers. So he didn't go back to make sure he had the right ticket, the numbers. He just assumed he did based off his memory. And how many know our memory can fail us at times? That we can, sometimes our eyes will deceive us that we will see what we want to see. So he got so excited that he said, oh, I got all this, I got millions of dollars now. So 
He took all his friends out, emptied out his savings, and they just went splurged on a shopping spree. He got into some serious debt. He was at a bar, and he told everybody, it's on the house. It's on me. And he took up, picked up everybody's tab. And then when he got home to pick up his ticket to turn in the numbers, he realized he does not have the winning ticket. And something in him is just, just sunk. He dropped, everything is gone. He thought he had the money, and he does it. And this church thinks they're rich. They're wealthy. But Jesus says they're po. Not poor, but po. You can't afford the ORs. That's how poor you are. It's just P-O. <laughs> They're poor. He says they're poor. When people become blessed, sometimes they forget where their blessing came from. Has this happened to you before? When you think you had something, you think of yourself more higher than you ought to. Has that happened to you before? They're rich in the natural, but spiritually they were in trouble and they lost the ability to see the truth. That's why Jesus says that they're blind. Now notice, notice what he says. It's an indictment against them. He says you're poor or excuse me, you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked, right? What are they known for in the city? Fashion, finance, and medicine, specifically for the eyes. He says, you, you, you think you're rich, you're not, you're poor. You think you can see, you're not, you're blind. He says, you think you're, you're dressed, but you're, you're actually naked. In verse 18, here's what he then says. In verse 18, he goes, uh, I counsel you. Here's, his, here's what he's saying. This is how you, he says, you want to change? You want to course correct? Here's how you do it. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that way you can become rich because they already are rich, right? They thought they were. He says, but come and get it from me. Then he says, and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness. What are they known for? Fashion, specifically black, wool, soft, soft, there's the imagery. They get, they're getting it. This, the people in Laodicea get it. So he says, so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that way you can see. Now, is he saying you literally have to go and buy it from the Lord? That's not what he's saying at all. He says you couldn't even afford it. What is he saying? He says you buy. When you buy something, what do you do? You exchange. When you're buying, you exchange your money for what you perceive to be of value. So what he's saying is whatever you value... Turn it all to me, your riches, your fashion, your medicine. Give it all to me in exchange. He says, I'm going to make you wealthy, spiritually. Some of you are like, I want it naturally too, but spiritually. He says, I'm going to give you clothes to cover your, your nakedness. And he says, and I'm going to give you something so that way you can have vision and you can see. Now, there's something that we call it self-righteous mentality, and this church has it. They think that they can provide for themselves. They're self-sufficient, right? They think that they can clothe themselves. They think that they are the ones who can open their own eyes. But God is saying, I'm the one who does that. Speaking of clothing yourselves, you know, in the, in the Old Testament, Genesis, the book of beginnings, we find that the moment that Adam and Eve sinned, they found out they were naked. And what did they do instantly? They created for themselves something to cover their private areas, most sensitive areas. But God sees it. And what does he do? He then kills an animal and covers them himself because their covering is not sufficient. And it's a prophetic picture of what was going to happen that us as mankind, we cannot clothe ourselves. We're all naked, every single one of us. And what he did is he killed the sacrificial lamb and he used the robe of righteousness, the righteousness that Jesus earned for us and what we didn't deserve. And he clothed us with it. People who are self-righteous don't see that. What they see is this. I can clothe myself. I can provide for myself. How are you going to get into heaven? By myself. My good works. My life. My life speaks for itself. Then you find out we all come short. If all of us owe $20 million to God and you owe five cents, I, you paid down five cents and I paid down 10 cents, I can't brag. We both are short. There's no way we're going to be able to pay $20 million. Okay, let me bump it up for some people, $200 trillion. No way. So what do we do? We go to who can provide. But you don't go to who can provide if you think you can provide for yourself. Self-sufficient. Verse 19. You still with me? I'm almost done. Okay. Still with me. Okay. 
Then he says, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Me saying this, he says, I am, I, the reason why he's saying this, giving this letter, is because he loves them. How do we know that? His actions. What's is that? He's rebuking them, and he's correcting them, and he's giving them a, a three-step formula in which they can correct. And I'll tell you that here in just a minute. But I think that that's something that we have to see is, did you know that God will rebuke you at times? He can. How many know that you're not always right? You know, my wife says it all the time. I'm Mr. Right. She's Mrs. Always Right. But nobody is always right. Have you ever been so mad? And I'll just say this. There's many things we can cover, but just for the sake of uh, the uh, time, forgiveness. Somebody wronged you. Somebody said something about you, and you don't want to forgive that person. Have you ever been to, you know, confronted God, and you convinced God, say, Lord, you know what? That person, you know what they did to me? Yeah, I know it's messed up. You know what? Why don't you pull back that forgiveness from them? Don't let them come to heaven. Just maybe let them sweat it out a little bit. Tell them they're not going to go, you know, and just, just let them just think they're not. But uh, I guess go ahead. But I don't want them to go. Is it okay if they don't come? Has God ever said to you, you know what? You're right. I didn't think about that. What does he do? He, can, he convicts your heart, right? And he tells you that you, you need to forgive. And he says he not only rebukes, he also, he not only corrects, he disciplines. And how many have been disciplined by God before? I mean, we're not quite sure what that might look like, but uh, let's say for, for parents, um, you know, <clears throat> because God is loving, he is going to discipline me. Because God is loving, he is going to rebuke me. Because God is loving, he's going to convince me, and he's also going to correct me because he loves me. And how do we know that? Because parents do that. If you love your child, you correct them, you rebuke them, you discipline them. If you don't love them, don't discipline them. Just, just let them run wild. Have at it. But if you love your children, you're going to rebuke them and discipline them. And some of that discipline includes spanking. Nobody likes to spank. You know, for me, for our kids, thankfully our kids have, and, and um, our kids are not perfect. I make sure I, I want to make sure that that's clear. And is it okay if my kids are not perfect? Are you guys all right with that? Expectations just lower it a little bit. But our kids are great kids. And we've, we've disciplined them. We've had to discipline them multiple times. And they're turning out all right. <laughs> one of the things I didn't like doing is I didn't like spanking, but we did it for their benefit. Now, there's a word that in, in Tagalog uh, for spanking, do you guys know the word? It's palo, right? That's what we'd say to our kids. You want palo? And there's another word, and sometimes I have a tendency of mixing up words in, in Tagalog, and I use a different word, and I used a word for passing gas. What is that word? Otot. I remember my son was misbehaving, and, and I looked at him. I said, Judah, do you want an otot? <laughs> he kind of walked away, me, like, confused. And then I'm like, why is he walking away from me? And he's like, Mommy, Daddy's going to otot on me. <laughs> <laughs> but we discipline because we, we love them. And the word discipline actually involves training ch your children. The Greek word for discipline or chasten is to, to train them in the way should they, that they're supposed to go. But I want to uh, land here, and then, and then we're going to wrap up. So the second clause says this. This is what he's telling them. I'm letting you guys know this corrective letter I'm giving you, though it seems harsh, it's a love letter. How do, I know, how do you know it's a love letter? He says it. I love you, therefore I'm going to rebuke you, and I'm going to discipline you. And here is what he says to this church who has become lukewarm. He says, so... Be earnest and repent. Everybody say earnest. Tina, where you at? Tina, earnest. Earnest is another word. Uh, zeal is another one. And it just means red, hot, fire, a passion. So be earnest. Repent. And then it says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Anyone who hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and eat with that person they would meet. So here's three things to do if you're lukewarm. First one is this. He says, be earnest. In other words, fire, hot passion. So warm it up. That's the first one. Warm, warm up. Warm it up. Fire it up. My wife used to preach this message one time. It's called Fire It Up, and she was a cheerleader, and she started the message this way. She said, fire it up and up and up and up and up. Fire it up. Fire it up. 
Fired up and up and up and up and up. Fired up. Fired up. Sing with me now. Stop. Fired up and up and up and up and up. Fired up. Fired up. Okay. When I, you know, because I play football, when you hear these cheers, it does make you want to like, yeah, fired up. We want to, we want to, we want a touchdown. You're in the huddle and you're like, you know what they want? They want a touchdown. Let's give them one. No. Fire it up and up and up and up. And she's talking about how to stay on fire for God. And this is just a sub point. I just give it to you very quickly. Here, here are three things uh, that she had said, and I changed it a little bit. And she's like, you can't change my revelation. But I said, I'm going to change it a little bit because it makes more sense this way. There's three things that are required f- to warm something up or for there to be a fire. Uh, the first is that there would be uh, 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 fuel. The second is that there's oxygen. And third, there's got to be heat or friction. So spiritually speaking, here's how we get it. The first is fuel. And, and, and what, is, what, is, what is fuel? Fuel is the Spirit of God. It's the dynamite, the d- dunamis power that comes on us. Do you, you remember when the Holy Spirit came? It came like in the form of a tongues of fire. It's, it's fuel, and it propelled the church into greater signs and wonders. Then the second is oxygen. What's oxygen? It's the breath of God. The breath of God is the voice of God, the Word of God. The Word of God is Jesus. Getting the Word of God in you. Breathing in God's Word. Getting His life, His breath in you. And the third is friction, heat. What is that? It's, it's the community of believers. We need each other. All of us do. You need somebody who can, who can rub against you. And that causes some heat. And you need people who can help fan that flame. Warm it up. Or fire it up, and up, and up, and up, and up, fire it up. Here's the second, is wise up. Repent. Repent is not a boo-hoo moment. <laughs> it can include tears. But it's the, the, the sign of true repentance is not a tear, it's a change of mind. It's a change of mindset. You renew it, you change it. And therefore, you usually go in a different, completely different direction. If you cried, you didn't repent. You just were sorrowful. If you cried and changed your mind, you repented. If you didn't cry and you changed your mind, you repented. Here's the last one is open up. Everybody say open up. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Now, when we talk about fire, here's something that's interesting. Is you guys know the story. It's very well told. I teach on it often when Peter denied Jesus three times. But on the night that he was betrayed, it's very interesting. The, the, the imagery that you can pull from here is that Jesus was being arrested and, and sent, uh, sent to be, uh, you know, tried. And Peter was following him at a distance. And at a distance, he didn't get too close to Jesus, but he was close enough that it says that he was cold and he sat with the soldiers by a fire and tried to warm himself up. And it's a picture of what happens when your fire starts to dwindle. It's because you're still following Jesus, you're just not close anymore. And you're trying to find other sources to warm you up. And you sit with the world thinking that what the world has to offer is going to bring that fire and that passion back in you when the reality is it's only the son of the living God, Jesus, who's the all-consuming fire that's going to be able to put the fire back in your spirit, fire back in your life. And then it says that this is what he does. He, 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 He stands at the door and knocks. What's interesting is He's speaking to his church, and in his church, he's not even in it. He's outside it. He's still there, just not welcome. What does he do? He just knocks. I stand at the door and knock. The Greek word for knock is something that gives the impression that it's a knock that's continuous. That he knocks, and he keeps knocking, and he keeps knocking, and he keeps knocking until the door opens. What's interesting is in Philadelphia, Jesus said, I set before you an open door, and I can open doors no man can shut. I can shut doors no man can open. But yet Jesus is knocking because this is the only door he can't open. Only you can. He's speaking not to just, he's not speaking to non-believers here. He's speaking to his church. He says, I stand at the door and knock. If you let me in, I'm going to dine with you. And the dine means he's going to have this intimate uh, moment this, this really intense, intimate moment with you if you allow him to come in. Now, this morning as I was uh, just asking the Lord how to close, I always ask the Lord, can you give me a good closing? 
just in case if it doesn't go well, the service, at least the closing is good. <laughs> As we were praying, and, and I don't mean to keep sharing stories of my wife and I, but this is the image the Lord gave me. And it's not just because it deals with my wife and I, but it's his attitude towards me as well. You know, we, we, uh, cel- we're celebrating 15 years of marriage uh, coming up in a, in a few months. And we've been together for almost 22 years, known each other half our life. We started dating at second grade. And, uh, and things are, are great, but it's got moments where we have to adjust just like anybody else. The roughest year for us was our first year of marriage when we've been dating eight years. And I assumed this is going to be a piece of cake because we know each other. But the moment we got married, it's like, wow, false advertisement. For marriage and my wife, both of them. <laughs> yeah, I was like, who are you? Like, you know, you're a different person. Uh, granted, I wasn't the easiest person to live with either, and I wasn't fulfilling my role as a husband in terms of just absent, um, you know. It's very home. I remember we were, she said one day, we hadn't, we, she brought to my attention, we haven't had dinner for four months together. It's just either working or did something for ministry or something like that. And, um, Everything kind of came to a head at one point where we just realized this is not working. And my wife wanted out. But so did I. And lukewarm. It's like we weren't so, so mad at each other. or You know, we just kind of right in the middle. It's just very lukewarm. Like, I could go with this or not. It doesn't matter to me. I'm indifferent. But I remember, you know, how crushed I was thinking that this is it. And you ever have those moments you're like, you're, you're, you're praying, you're like, God, I've been faithful. Like, do you not see what I've done for you and the sacrifices I've made? And you're trying to convince God that he needs to do something because of how good you've been. And then when you get through those things, you realize that God is the only one who's, who's been so good all the way through consistent. And that's why I give, you know what I say all the time? God is good. All the time, all the time, God is good because I know he is good. But there was a night when it just kind of came to myself. And I said, you know what? I want this to work. And so I told my wife, I, I'm not accepting a divorce. But she wasn't having it. And she locked herself in the bathroom of our room. And I'm like, I can open up doors. No man can shut and shut doors. No, I didn't say that to her. But I waited for a minute. And I remember I just stood outside the door of our bathroom. I just, just knocked on the door. And I was hoping she would answer, but she didn't. I knocked again. She didn't answer. I waited a little bit, and I knocked again to see if I could come in, but no answer. So I put my, put my head against the door, and this is what I heard. <laughs> <sighs> she had fallen asleep. So I just, I remember I just waited. And I just waited by the door. I'm not going to barge in, just waiting for her to open the door. And then uh, all of a sudden, she put on this song. It was, it's a song that's sentimental to us. It, um, it's called Your Love is Extravagant. And I could just hear it through the bathroom. And I knocked on the door to see if she would answer, and she didn't, she didn't answer. But I waited. I had to eat, so I went to the kitchen. Then I came back, and I waited, and I waited. It's probably like 4, maybe 4 in the morning, maybe really late at night. As I'm waiting there, the door opened. Oh, I can't tell you. It's been 15 years, but still, I remember it. And that was the beginning of our restoration. But what gets me the most is this, is that I have been my wife to Jesus. There are times I'm like, I ain't done. I don't want to do this anymore. And then he's knocks on the door of my heart. What's his knock? His knock is his voice. He says, if anybody hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in. And there are times we all go through moments like that. Lord, I don't want to do this anymore. Or I don't like this. But he's faithful. He'll keep knocking. Keep knocking. He'll keep knocking. He'll keep knocking. He'll knock. He'll knock. He'll knock. He'll knock. He'll never stop knocking. And he waits for you to open that door. And when you open that door, he dines with you. 
And whatever fire you lost, he gives you a new fire. A fire that's dwindling, he'll give you fuel for that fire. All you got to do is open the door. The Lord is speaking. He has spoken. He is speaking. All throughout these, these seven weeks, it's a letter for the church is throughout all generations. He's speaking. He's spoken. He's speaking to you right now. Question for some of you is, are you listening? He who has an ear, let him hear. The Spirit says to the churches. Let me pray for you. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, Lord, that you are good. We thank you, for Father, that you, you, that you, you continually seek after us. Even when our hearts are hardened, Lord, turned away from you, you never turn away from us. Moments where we've turned away from a brother or sister in the Lord, you still are faithful to us, and you're faithful to them. In moments where we have completely disregarded your word, still we're there. You're still knocking on the door of our heart today. Lord, we, I thank you for every time you've spoken a word, whether it be through a brother or sister in the Lord or directly through your word, or in times where we get to just be alone with you, where you speak to our hearts. Because every time you speak to your heart, our hearts, Lord God, it's a way of you telling us that you're at the door and you're knocking. And you're not going to ever barge in. You wait for us to open that door. And the moment that that door swings open, you come in. And you do what only you can do. You re revive us. You refire us. You give us purpose. You give us life. You give us vision. I thank you, Father, that in, in the moments that we maybe have taken our eyes off of you and focused on provision, and we know that you, you prosper us, Lord God, and add no sorrow to it, but there are times where we can take our focus off of the provider and focus on the provision. Father, we ask that you forgive us for that. If we have put money in your place, in our heart and in our lives, Lord, we ask that you forgive us for that. Our desire is not for us to be complacent. We want to walk in step with your spirit. And if there is any lukewarmness in us, Father, we pray that you begin to raise the temperature in our hearts and in our lives so that way we can burn with an earnest and a fresh passion and desire, red hot, Lord God, for you and the things of God. Lord, I thank you that for those who have been closed off to you that this is today, you're reminding them that you're still at the door, that they didn't miss it, you're still knocking. And if they'll just open up, Lord God, you'll touch their hearts and you'll set it within them a new fire, a new passion, a new desire. Lord, we just ask right now that you just begin to minister to your people. As our worship team begins to lead us in a song, Lord, I pray, Father, that you continue to speak to the hearts of your people that we may not be the same, that we're changed. Everybody's hearts are open, Lord God. We declare that decree for you to come on in. So Lord, we gladly say, come. Come in, God. Thank you, Lord.